world. <laughs> oh well, someday. Um, okay, let's do the homework three solution. <laughs> How'd you find this one? I thought it was pretty straightforward. Given that you know, there's a lot of short lectures. Yeah. Well, don't don't let your points for influence you too much one way or the other, right? These are homework. So the important part is to get something out of the solutions. And then you're all set for the exam. Was there something else that we want to talk about? I'm sorry, they're all looking at you. <laughs> I was afraid I was missing something. <laughs> um, Class has started, I guess. Yeah, we're back, back to work. Um, He's got what he needed. <laughs> well, well, we'll find out. Longitudinal modes in a normal laser can lead to more problems with the dispersion compared to a DFB laser. True or false? True. Yep. Um, and here's the lecture notes that back that up. The DFB lasers are the nice, nicest ones we have now. And it works like this fiber Bragg grating. It's, the, it's like a mirror that's distributed over the whole uh, slab here, rather than putting your mirrors at the end. The problem with putting your mirrors at the end is just like, you know, on a guitar string or any other kind of resonator or cavity, you get um, a bunch of different modes at which it's happy to oscillate at. Right? Has anybody seen, how many people have seen the film, or it's probably on YouTube now, of the Tacoma Bridge? Oh, yeah. The, yeah. Oh, isn't that amazing? The wind blew across the cavity and it hit the resonant frequency, and the bridge starts oscillating, and steel and concrete just ripping apart and throwing cars in the can. You know, that's resonance, right? And resonance is pretty powerful. So each one of these is a resonant frequency, like blowing across a soda pop bottle. Or the, okay? And um, but if you hit it harder, you can get a different tone to show up. And the, those frequencies, it's pretty easy to see just by thinking about the wavelength. Uh, separation of the frequencies is a speed of light divided by this distance. Anyway, you get all these different kinds of resonant modes for that cavity. Then your gain media has some range of frequencies at which I have amplification. So this thing can laze at all these different tones. And so that would be a big spread of frequencies I could be at, right? And we know that dispersion is worse when you have a bigger delta lambda, a bigger spread in frequencies. And one of the ways we got around dispersion was say, make every channel slice smaller. Then it's not such a pain for every customer. Okay, so um, that one's true. Questions, comments? All right, and the second one. Um, no problem. Hey, crank it up. <laughs> Using PSK or QAM, the receiver is sensitive to phase, so those are called coherent. True or false? True. Oh, you're all so smart. You are now. <laughs> We've all made that happen together. Right? Um, PSK, you know, there are dots around it. Phase shift keen obviously cares about phase, right? I have so many dots in a circle. There's a cosine part of my wave, there's a sine wave part of my wave. Clearly, it's phase sensitive, right? Likewise, in QAM, even though they're not dots on a circle, anymore, I still have to tell the difference between sine and cosine. There's cosine, there's sine. I gave an extra lecture on uh, some of that, where I got into the details. 
There's a QAM modulator. I've got your phone call coming in, getting hit by cosine. My phone call gets hit by sine. It's like two channels for the price of one. And so this gets broadcast in radio. That's the actual antenna and fiber that's launched onto a fiber. And I have to be able to undo it at the receiver. I have to demodulate it, in other words. So at the receiver, I've got my own little oscillator. How does it know what cosine is compared to the transmitter? I could, in a laboratory experiment, I could do what's called leaking the carrier. You take this carrier and run it through a cable, right? and then bring it over to the receiver, and then phase shift it or adjust the length of the cable so that what this one is calling cosine is the same as what this one's calling cosine. Then I can turn off my carrier recovery circuit and test the rest of my equipment. It's called leaking the carrier. But clearly, this guy's cosine has to match up with that one's cosine, right? Or otherwise, I'm gonna swap these phone calls. So, in a real system then, they don't send the carrier down a separate piece of cable. My receiver, the local oscillator is local to my receiver and it has to figure out what do you think is the right phase here. And various schemes and algorithms for being able to do that, okay, to set the phase. We also have to set the frequency because even in the best with lasers, there's some line width there. It can that <coughs> frequency can drift around a little bit. Things always drift in temperature and such. So um, the information is in the phase. It is sensitive to phase. Yeah. And then the rest of that is just the meaning of the word coherent. It's a fancy way of saying phase sensitive. What's the uh, degrees differences between shifts? In other words, you said temperature can affect it. So if you're running from here to Alaska, you have to take that into consideration. Um, or no? Good, 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 good question. Uh, probably not. The temperature effects I was talking about would be more like within my laser. If this is hotter or colder, it's going to expand or contract, and that's going to shift the resonance <coughs> frequency I'm at. Okay. And that's that's a brings up an interesting issue when you in the industry when you modulate the laser to get the information on there. One thing you could do is change the current going through it to turn it on and off. But if you're doing that, then when it's on and off, the temperatures are going to be different, and so that makes it kind of a mess. So instead, you use those electro-optic modulators. You leave your laser on all the time, so it's at one temperature, and then you use the electro-optic modulators to put the info on it. Good. Any others? Okay. In a Raman fiber amplifier, the pump wavelength has to be which? Bigger or smaller than the signal wavelength? Mm -hmm. Well, we had that same question in a, two different ways with the with the other with the EDFAs. Mm -hmm. Is the answer going to change now that I'm using the Raman effect? <clears throat> One was the frequency, I thought. Yeah, and frequency. This was the wavelength. Frequency versus wavelength is is something to look out for, right? And the other variation here. The reason I thought, well, it's not too bad to put this one in was because I talked a little bit about Raman scattering and I drew the energy levels because that's um, a lot of people in optics are going to be saying those words as well as the Brill one, stimulated Brill one effect that prevents me from shoving more energy into my fiber. In the EDFA, I drew something like this, and I said you pump it up to there and it trickles down. And then you have a population inversion here for the signal. In the Raman 
fiber amplifier, the energy levels look like this. And then this is your pump. And then you have a population inversion immediately, but it trickles, it jumps down to a different color because you've got these vibrational modes. And so here's your signal energy gap. Well, in both cases, the pump jump is bigger. So they're both going to have the same answer. And in both cases, the energy jump, call it delta E if you like, is bigger. So the frequency of the pump is bigger. And if that's true, if the frequency, let's see, frequency times wavelength is some constant. So if frequency goes up, wavelength has to come down. This is my, my way of not messing this up, so that flips it, so the wavelength of the pump <coughs> has to be smaller than the wavelength of the signal. Okay. Now I can answer all variations on this. Oddly enough, there are Brahman fiber amplifiers, or um, Brillouin fiber amplifiers. I don't see how, because the bandwidth is smaller, but I guess they have an application some more. Um, but any time anybody cooked up anything else in the future, okay, these simple little pictures can help you do a nice little sanity check as to whether they're selling you a bunch of hooey or not. So, back to the homework. Raman wavelength. Raman EDFA doesn't change it. Wavelength in terms of wavelength, the wavelength of my pump is smaller than the wavelength of the signal. So pump wavelength this is the tricky part. Read it carefully. Don't flip things around. Pump wavelength has to be smaller. Did I get it right? Good. Questions? Okay, birefringent media or birefringent material. This is like what makes up one of those quarter wave plates we talked about. Is that an example of nonlinear optics? No. 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 Good. So this is false. Why not? Because it's just a chunk of crystal, right? And yes, I can have nonlinear optics and crystals, and that's usually that's where you do your nonlinear optics. But there's only one frequency comes in and the same frequency comes out. Yeah, that's a good clue of is anything nonlinear happening? Did the frequency change? No. So this is like a nice linear amplifier. The song going in is a tone la, and the song coming out of my speaker is a tone la. Everything is nice and linear like I would want in my stereo. And the la comes in and out comes Oh, I've got some nonlinear distortion going on there. Right. I'll change your frequencies. This is wonderful because you can all understand these things without having to do all the math. The people who can do the math, they usually don't understand the things. <laughs> like, oh, I didn't do the math, but what's going on? Oh, I don't know. I just learned how to do the math. I'm not criticizing people who know how to do the math, but we were always, it was, a, it was kind of a given <laughs> that in grad school we knew how to do the math, but they said, but do you know what it means? Um, 
electro-optic effect. There's some optical frequency that comes in, but there's also uh, information that's modulating it. And if you think about it, this might have come in as a tone, but this out here, there's spectrum on it. The frequencies have been changed. So yes, this is nonlinear. Did you get that one right? Good. And, um, you know, compared to optical frequencies, uh, 10 gigahertz or something looks like DC almost. That's why I labeled it as DC. But there is another wave that's mixing with this wave. So it's nonlinear. Linear polarization along X plus Y is input to a stack of two quarter wave plates. I better keep track of that. Two quarter wave plates. X is fast and Y is slow. What comes out? And I'm along this direction. Okay, so I have a component, a certain amount that's lined up with X and a certain amount of component that's lined up along the Y axis. So this is going to split into one going faster than the other. Good. What if I put my linear polarization just along the X axis? And I have nothing along the slow axis. What's going to come out of that? It's still going to be linear. Right? I'm only fast compared to that. I won't see it if I don't have some of that to compare against. I just thought of that one. <laughs> what do you think? Exam question. Um, but some, th some variation along these lines would, would be acceptable. That one would be maybe a little too tricky. It's a little different. Maybe that makes it good. And I already brought it up, right? That's nice and anyway, we'll see. Um, so I have some that's going to go faster than the other. So this is going to split up and do its little dance. Um, let's pick up the lecture notes on that. taking the exam and I lost my lecture notes. So I have to do it this way. <laughs> right? This one, one of these slows. Huh? Oh, that's, I can draw the sine and the cosine pictures again, or I could probably just remember at least that when I go through one quarter wave plate, it went to circular. Right. Whether that's right-handed or left-handed depends on am I propagating in plus Z or minus Z. That's, I think I called that a finer point, so I probably wouldn't make a good exam question along those lines. I go through another one of these, what happens? Linear. Yeah, I'm back to linear, but I'm perpendicular, so it would be blocked if I tried to do that polarizer trick 
and that's the way the isolator worked. I wanted to show another picture. Now. Mm -hmm. That's right. You have your lecture notes. You can look at that some more. So um, I didn't even really have to figure out which one's the slow, which one's the fast. Is this right-handed? Is this left-handed? It's just I go through one quarter wave plate. I went from linear to circular. I go through another one. I go to linear that's perpendicular to that. Right? If I went through another one, I'd go to circular the other way, okay, which mathematically is kind of perpendicular to that. And then if I go another quarter wave plate, I'm back to where I started. Okay. And it makes sense. That's 90 degrees, 90 degrees. <coughs> Did that go far enough? 90, 90. Oh, there's 90. And then another 90 adds up to 360. I'm back to where it started. All right, so back to the question at hand. I go through two of these. I went from linear to circular and then to linear. And it's linear along the other direction. I started out along this one plus y goes to x minus y. Questions on that? Oh. Um, this one I thought was probably the only tricky one, maybe. Um, with electro-optic modulators, I can make um, which ones of these? Well, in the notes, I said I could make it on off, right? I do have a picture of that here. All right, so the electro optic modulator, it is a nonlinear effect, um, but this other field is, compared to optical, it's, it's at DC. The 10 gigahertz is, is roughly DC compared to optical. So I apply that to these electrodes. And then that creates an electric field. And the electric field controls this birefringence. Makes one axis faster, one polarization runs faster than the other. The speed difference is set by how strong this field is, which is set by the voltage I apply here. So it's a voltage controlled, uh, kind of like a quarter wave plate. It's a voltage controlled difference in the speeds of the polarizations. Okay. And then the rest of this structure is there's a splitter. There's a combiner. Those are called interferometers. They split the signal. Part of it goes through one phase shift. Part of it goes through another phase shift. I recombine them. I'll get constructive and destructive interference here, just like in any two waves. I'm adding them. Right? If they're in phase, I get a bright spot. If they're out of phase, I get a dark spot. So that makes my electro-optic modulator is another way of looking at it. If I wanted to see it over this range, I'm nonlinear. That doesn't look like a line. But if I wanted to just operate over a smaller range, even though that's like cosine, <coughs> it can look closer to a line. Right? So rather than turning it all the way off and all the way on, I could have uh, more like a continuous AM. I could make it go big and small and somewhere in between. <coughs> so I could make an AM modulator out of this. An analog AM modulator. It's optical. 
or I can just drive it all the way on and off and make it digital. Um, that happened when I set these voltages in a certain way. One is basically the minus of the other. On the missing page, it says if um, thanks. It says if V2 equals V1, you have that in your notes. I just my dog ate my homework, I guess. Um, if I make them equal to each other, then the transmission is just equivalent to a phase shift. So it doesn't turn it on and off. It doesn't modulate the amplitude anymore. It's just equivalent to a phase shift box. So I can make the on-off trick, which if I operate here could be uh, a analog AM modulator. I can make an on-off modulator. Hmm. Can I make, um, I can have a phase shift box. So I'm thinking, well, there's hope here. I showed the way in which um, I kind of split this a couple times and it said, yes, you can make a QPSK modulator. I'm going to do that a little differently. For example, I was looking at that structure and I thought, you know, you don't really have to build it that complicated. I've got a phase shifter, right? So I could drive this another way. Compared to notes, I can see why they do it in practice the way that's in the notes, which is from the books. But, um, and just this thing, one of these would do it. In that other way, it said split it kind of twice. Right. The other way had this. perfectly clear. That box is an EO modulator. This box is one EO modulator. Okay. I can control the phase. Set by the voltage. By voltage and it sets that phase. In the crazy way we did in the notes and in the books, they're splitting this up and then they set the voltages so that this one of these is the cosine part and the other is the sine part. And then they drove these in a way to make it so that the phases were zero or pi. Right? And likewise this one was zero or pi. Call that a one, call this a two. OK. 
Okay, so what's the signal constellation I've got um, on the cosine part? I'm either here with a phase of zero, or I'm here with a phase of pi. All right, on the sine wave part, I'm either here with a phase of zero, or here with a phase of pi. So I got four dots. QPSK, unfortunately. <coughs> the four dots on a circle is also four dots in a square, so if you want to call that 4QAM, I guess you'd count this one too. But that's not what I was looking for. How many people went that path? How many people said QAM, yes, because four dots on a circle is four dots on a square? You did that. Honestly? No. <laughs> you did that. Almost honest. <laughs> I'm not sure which part you're being honest about. No. <laughs> um, we'll, we'll get back to the QAM. Right? And if, if I were to go that nasty path on an exam, which is unlikely, then I'd have to avoid this little issue with my lawyers who could say, Ah, but 4 PSK is also 4 QAM, right? But you go beyond that, QAM and PSK don't look like each other anymore, right? So that's one way of doing it, but hey, you know, I could set this okay, to be anything I want. So here's a way that looks simpler. Here's my other way of doing it. Just give me one the EO modulator. I set that phase by setting the voltage. It doesn't have to be plus or minus one volt, zero pi phases. It could be anything I want. Really? So here I could, with one EO modulator, I could make four PSK. Instead of four different settings, give me eight different settings. Any PSK. So the reason why they're doing it this seemingly more complicated way is because of practical issues, signal to noise ratios. It's easier to just turn the voltage between uh, plus and minus one, drive it all the way one, one, one direction or all the way the other direction. But if I wanted to be more jazzy about the voltages <coughs> I control here, then I could build it this way. Good. I see a lot of people see that. Okay. You could. So why do it this crazy way? It must just be a technical issue. It seemed more reasonable to them to say, well, let's let's split it up this way, and then I I don't. Well, it'd be more robust. I don't have to worry about. I've only got two different voltage states rather than trying to control four of them. Binary AM is easier than four level AM. But if I wanted to, I could I could uh, do eight PSK out of one EO modulator. Now how could I do QAM? I mean real QAM, not four QAM. Certainly I can split things into a sine and a cosine. Okay. But can I Turn one of these EO modulators, I can make on off, right? Could I make four level? Not in a real sharp way. So, but I guess in this sense, I could say, all right. 
There's going to be one level, there's going to be another level, and there's another level, and there's another level. Kind of messy because it's not real sharp, but in principle, I guess I could make this a four state amplitude modulator, but it's, it, you know, it doesn't look very robust. It's not like you know, the on and the off, that's bam, bam, on, off, right? On, off. I don't see a natural way of thinking of this as four different levels. Okay, so I was thinking the answer would be no, but instead the answer is either way is okay. <laughs> I doubt that you put that much thought into it, but you are now, right? So, so we won't take points off, <coughs> no matter how you, whether you click that one or not, right? Because you could have said, well, that's also for QAM, right? But you could have also said, well, I can split things into sine and cosine, right? And my EO modulator rather than just being hard on and off, I could think of it as an amplitude modulator, and I could put in four different levels, four different amplitudes. So you could do it. I don't think it worked very good, but you could do it. In the industry, I don't, I don't think anyone would go this path, but on uh, homework, you, you could have possibly thought that way. The important thing is you learn something, right? <laughs> but just see what I'm saying, too. It's not a natural. This looks like two levels, right? <clears throat> it's hard to see that as a sharp four levels, so it's not going to work very good. But in principle, you, you could pretend that that would work, but good luck selling it to anyone because it's not going to work well. Questions, comments on that? All right. Polarization mode dispersion is due to the fact that one polarization travels faster than the other in normal fiber. True. There is um, polarization preserving fiber. It does exist. That's very expensive. So I don't think it's really caught on in the industry yet. But there are ways <coughs> of doing it. To, to do it, you kind of have to um, split the symmetry somehow. You need to um, make it so the X direction doesn't look like the Y direction. So the modes don't overlap. One way of doing that is dual core. So are you saying that that fiber can be faster than the polarization? I'm saying that in normal fiber, it's hard to, you don't really have much control over Am I sending my pulse X polarized or Y polarized? I, it's hard for me to control that. Right? You can see, all you have to do is turn the fiber. Right? So how the heck am I going to control that? Here, however, is different. then why? So I can set it up so that, okay, I'm only going to excite the X polarized mode. Or I'm going to set it up so I'm only going to set up the, the Y polarized mode. 
because they don't just spill one into the other and I can preserve that. But that's kind of experimental stuff and it's, it's expensive. It's done in the labs, but it's not done in the industry. No one's come up with a nice, cheap way of... So, uh, so I guess what I'm asking was, the PMD is due to the fact that one polarization travels in normal fiber. So if... Uh, it's due to the fact that one polarization travels faster right. than the other yeah, in normal fiber. And this particular fiber does... In this one, they still might, but I can send my information only along one or only along the other. Excellent. Yeah. Good, good, great point. Here, they might still travel at different speeds, but I could set it up so that, yeah, I'm not going to use that one. Okay, so I don't have to worry about it. Everybody see that? Excellent. To make it not happen, I mean, it's, it's possible, but I, uh, again, that's probably going to be real expensive. Pretty much any kind of crystal will have this property of one polarization going at a different speed than the other. And glass is a crystal. In a sense. Good. Wow. Any others? All right. With one quarter wave plate, I can turn linear into circular. Yeah, duh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, know that by now. Can I turn circular into linear? Yeah. Yep. yep. Yeah, duh. You've had the graduate level course. Those two were easy. Um, what else could I think of? I don't know. Can you think of any good exam questions? What's your name? Okay, there's one. Shepard's a great teacher. There's another. That's a true or false. True or false. What's your answer? Whichever makes you happy. I guess I'll find out. <laughs> What did I say in the email? Didn't I say I it's going to be the entire weekend this time? Uh, when did you send that? I didn't oh, see an email. Let me look. Did you send that today? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> see why I get a B on organization every now and then. <laughs> um, I, was, I was working overtime making up for that TA mess. Ah, that upset me. Um, we today. said that it would be on the 8th, right, mm -hmm. which is Saturday. I guess I just, uh, I'm glad you asked. I was, I was just thinking. Um, now, Fahim's going to upload it, and everything should go just ducky. Right. So we should be able to log in sometime Saturday and do it? And, but I was going to make Sunday. it. My original plan was to make it 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. on Saturday, but I don't want to be in a position where, you know, Moodle crashed or something like that could happen. Then um, I'm thinking, well, why not just have it out there all weekend? Does it all weekend sound better? Yeah. Just good. We'll put our we'll put our safety net in first this time. Okay. So how about? 8 a.m. Saturday to 5 p.m. Sunday. And some real good questions for the test would be straight, exact questions. Out of the <laughs> oh, those wouldn't be any fun the at all. Previous homework. We could probably get those correct. Sir. And. Um, <laughs> Really, it should be like, like we said, once you open it, you have five hours to finish it. Uh, otherwise, somebody could come along and say, yeah, they had plenty of time to talk about this. Right? 
Yeah, I know. That's the way I feel too. But. So if you start taking it and you go back later, it still keeps the same time? Say something happens when you start you're, at five hours? Yeah, you're really, you're really supposed to open it and finish it and then you shouldn't be able to come back and reopen it. Right. I know that that was kind of the way the corrected version turned out, but I just left it that way. I was like, I'm not touching this, so we're not changing anything, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, the last one was based on the last attempt. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. <laughs> well, <laughs> <Not> really, <no. laughs> some people don't. Uh, so it's going to be available at 8 a.m. Saturday. That's what? November the 8th? To 5 p.m. Sunday, November 9th. Once you open it, You have the maximum time Moodle allows is five hours to finish it. And we'll just leave it at that. Um, if, however, something happens in the middle of taking it, I would advise you print it out if you can. Print it out. Anybody have a problem printing it out? You can't print it. Usually you can't print it. You can print screen it. Yeah, you could print screen. Or you could um, just, when you when you put in your answers, jot down on a piece of paper. Right? Number one, I put B or something like that. Just in case some, you know, your computer crashes. Right. And then, you know, if your computer crashes or something, then you can send us an email. Say, oh, my computer crashed. Here are my answers. I'm, what's that expression? Just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not out to get you. Is that a joke? <laughs> I'm, I'm being overly cautious after what happened last time. So the part covered in the uh, test one will also be included here, or? I'm sorry, say again. So the part covered in test one will also be included in this, or is this is Yeah, it'll, it'll be, um, again, about 50-50 between the yeah. first two and the last homework. Right. Okay. Or maybe it's 30-30-30. But uh, it's roughly, um, so it does involve things from the previous, right? I think that makes more sense because we spent a lot of time on the previous. But also, it, even if I tried to say it's, it's just on the newer topics, that's impossible because, you know, some of the, the newer topics hinge on the previous topics. My lawyer would say you can't get away with that. <laughs> They didn't know what frequency and wavelength meant until you did the other stuff. But my intention will be about half on homework three and the other half on homework one and two topics. Right. But if it comes down to, ooh, I, uh, the, I need to tweak it a little bit, uh, I will. So I want it to be good questions. Well thought out. But it'll be a lot like exam one, except for all the snafus, all the terrifying things, the stress. So if, you ha if there is any kind of problem, there won't be on our side, but if you have a computer problem, if your computer crashes, just tell me. Don't broadcast the whole class, because then they'll think, <gasps> <laughs> he went back to Tabid. <laughs> We're in trouble. <laughs> I don't mean to blame him so much, but it's hard not to. So you'll be online that day? Oh, yeah. <laughs> All weekend. <laughs> From 8 a.m. Saturday to 5 p.m. Sunday. Unless Comcast turns me off or the electricity goes out.
Anything else?